chapter 20 is where we'll study from this morning, Exodus chapter 20. I trust you have your Bibles with you and you'll turn there with us today. Looks like we survived the blizzard of 2016 with our eighth of an inch of snow that shut us down a couple of days. The sun is shining today. It's a beautiful Lord's Day. We're blessed to have you with us. If you are visiting, you're special to us, you're an honored guest. And we trust that you'll be blessed by being with us today. I ask that you keep uh, with Derek Killen and Brad Killen and their families in your prayers. Derek's mom passed away her services today in Tuscumbia at Morrison's visitation this morning from 11 to 1. The service will be at 1. So uh, I'll have to be getting out of here pretty quickly after we dismiss today. And, and uh, I ask you to keep uh, this family in your prayers also, the Horace Stutz family and uh, Miss Addie's family and uh, Miss Pitts and others. We've lost so many this week, and uh, we just uh, pray that you'll lift these families up in your prayers uh, at this time. We also want to keep on our hearts uh, Brother Don Jones. He and Mira will be traveling in the morning. He'll be going for a procedure. And uh, also, Ms. Velma Grigsby will have a procedure this week. So let's keep these in our prayers and others. And I ask God's blessings to be upon them. If you're not a Christian today, I want you to open your heart to this message this morning. I believe what I've got to say today will help us all in uh, living the Christian life. And if you're not a Christian, it'll provoke you to want to think about your precious soul. I've entitled today's message... Confronting idolatry in our lives. Confronting idolatry in our lives. Exodus chapter 20. Let's look at the first six verses to get our text. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water beneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Verse 6, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. More than anything else, God wants you and me to love him with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our mind, and all of our strength. God does not want a place in your life. God wants first place, and first place alone. He wants us to love Him and worship Him above everyone and everything else. And beloved, any time you and I allow someone or something to come between us and God. You know what happens? We incite the righteous jealousy of God. Now listen closely this morning. God is not going to play second fiddle to anyone or anything in our lives. He is either our all in all or he is nothing at all in our lives. There's no in between. He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's still jealous today, just like he was thousands of years ago when this was written. God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so in today's message, we're all going to see some things that maybe we unknowingly we allow to come between us and God as idols in our lives without even realizing it. And if we are to be serious about following Jesus Christ and going to heaven, we must confront idolatry head on. In our lives today in this country which we live with all its gadgets and all its goodies 
and toys that we are so blessed with. And to better understand today's message, I want us first of all to get a basis to consider the problem of idolatry in ancient Israel. When you read the Old Testament, you see all the wonderful accounts where God revealed himself to his people. He revealed his incredible power and his glory to the Israelite people. And you know, it's hard to understand why they would repeatedly turn from the living God and worship false gods of wood and stone and graven images, but they did. And during the Old Testament times, idolatry was generally associated with images made out of gold or silver or wood or stone that represented some god from another nation. Sometimes these gods were in a strange, distorted human appearance. Sometimes they were in the image of an animal or some bizarre looking creature. The most common idols worshipped by the Israelites were the Canaanite male fertility god called Baal and his female partner Asherah. We read of other Old Testament idols that God's people often turned to and these were the idols of Dagon of the Philistines, Chemosh of the Moabites, and Milcom of the Amorites. And we must understand, beloved, that idolatry was Israel's greatest sin. And out of all the nations on this earth, God had selected Israel, the Jews, to be his chosen people. And yet they blatantly, they rejected the one true living God in favor of a bunch of worthless, counterfeit gods. They prayed to gods who could neither hear nor answer their prayers. They showed love for gods who could not love them back. They trusted in gods who could neither protect them nor provide for them. And along with this worship of these idols, Israelites, they also descended into other abominable sins such as prostitution and drunkenness and even sacrificing their own children over an open fire to please these false idols. The Old Testament provides us with numerous accounts of Israel's idolatry. Here's just a few. In Genesis chapter 31, we read there of how Rachel, the wife of Jacob, we see her stealing her father's household idols to take with her to the land of Israel. In Exodus chapter 32, the most familiar of all accounts of idolatry in the Old Testament is remember when Aaron molded that golden calf. While Moses was on top of that mountain receiving the commandments of the Lord and the children of Israel started worshiping that golden calf, that animal. We read in 1 Kings chapter 11 where King Solomon, the wisest and richest man who ever lived, he married many foreign women who turned his heart away from God. In fact, Solomon even went so far as to build high places and temples for his wives so they could worship these pagan gods. And one of the saddest verses in all the Bible is found in 1 Kings 11 and verse 4 that tells us when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away from God to worship other gods. In 1 Kings chapter 12, King Jeroboam, you remember he erected two golden calves for the Israelites to worship. One was placed in the city of Bethel, the other in the city of Dan. And probably the most despicable of all the idolatry accounts of the nation of Israel is found in 1 Kings chapter 16. When Israel's king Ahab married this wicked, godless woman of Sidonia named old Jezebel. And Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal. And in honor of his wicked wife, you remember Ahab was led around by her by the nose and he did anything she wanted. And so he built the temple of Baal in Samaria. 
And together, Ahab and Jezebel, they led God's people to the lowest levels of idolatry and depravity of any king who reigned before them. Time after time, God would send prophets. They would warn his people to turn away from their idols and to turn back to the living God, but they did not listen. God eventually brought the kingdoms of Judah and Israel to ruin because of their idolatrous ways. And after all that God had done for his people, for them to turn from the living God and to worship idol worship was the equivalent of them spitting in God's face. And saying, God, I don't believe in you, I don't trust you, and I don't love you. And now over 20 centuries later, we see they're still suffering the consequences of their idolatrous ways. Well, what about us today? Is there a danger of us today falling into this same depravity? Well, let's consider this morning maybe some idols that we must confront today. If I were to ask you this morning, are you an idol worshiper? Chances are every one of you would quickly dismiss that with a little chuckle and say, me? An idol worshiper? Are you kidding me? When we think of idol worshipers today, we think maybe of a picture maybe of a Buddhist in a Buddhist monk in a long robe chanting to a giant image. Or maybe in our minds we may picture a large room filled with a bunch of Muslims and then falling down on their knees and on their face with their face toward Mecca and praying to their God Allah. But listen to this stern warning that God gives to us today in the New Testament in 1 John 5, verse 21, when John wrote to us and he says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. The Apostle Paul chimed in as well. To us in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 14 when he says, Therefore, my beloved, flee, run from idolatry. Now again, to whom were John and Paul addressing these warnings? They were to us. They were to Christians. They're saying to us today through the living word of God, Christian, you better keep yourself away from modern day idols. Don't fall into idol worship with all the gadgets you have in your society today. Now we must understand, again, that idols encompass a whole lot more than images carved out of wood or stone or gold. Listen, in the most basic sense, this morning, young people, an idol is anything in your life that takes the rightful place of God. Are you listening? An idol is anything in your heart and life that takes the rightful place of God in your life. An idol is anything or anyone that is worshipped or loved as a God, little g. An idol is anything or anyone that has a greater priority in your life than does God. An idol is anything or anyone that we devote excessive amount of our time and attention to that draws us away from the living God. An idol is anything that we give excessive attention and value and praise to that rightfully belongs to God and God alone. Now, when you look, At this broad definition of idols and idolatry, there's certainly a number of things that we have to look at this morning that could qualify as candidates for idolatry, aren't there? Let's just consider very briefly a few 
of these idolatry things that we can look at today. First of all, the Bible tells us the love of money can be an idol. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed away from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What are you saying, Paul? He's telling us that many have strayed away from the Lord because of their love affair with the almighty dollar. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve two masters. You'll love the one and hate the other. You'll hold to the one and despise the other. He says you cannot serve God and money. But we all know there's nothing at all wrong with money itself. There's nothing wrong with having money or making money in an honest way. But when attaining money, Paul is saying, listen, when attaining that money is an obsession and it takes over one's life, that becomes an idol. And that's why Paul says, for the love of money, that obsession for it is the root of all kinds of evil and that's when it becomes an idol also the Bible warns us maybe the love of material things can be an idol you remember the rich young ruler Matthew 19 such a good boy he came to Jesus and he said good teacher what good thing can I do to have eternal life and Jesus asked him to keep the commandments didn't he and he said Lord, I've kept these commandments since I was a young boy. And then Jesus told him there was one thing that he liked. And the rich young ruler said, what's that? And Jesus said, go sell what you have and give it to the poor. And you can have treasure in heaven. The Gospel of Matthew tells us, but when that young man heard that, he went away sorrowful. Why? For he had great possessions he had great possessions like the rich young ruler possessions material things can easily become an idol in our lives that was an idol in his life it's very easy to become so obsessed today in this country with our cars and our boats and our jewelry and our gadgets and our clothes and all these other things in our life that can become our God so when we look at the account of the rich young ruler living in this country when we are all wealthy compared to the world, we all have great possessions compared to the world. And may we never let those things that God blesses us with come as an idol between us and God is what Paul is saying. Well, also the Bible warns us people can become an idol. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 12, Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Peter. And he asks, is Christ divided? Did Paul die for you? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Just a few months ago, we all saw the nonstop coverage of the Pope's visit to the United States. Thousands upon thousands lined the streets just to get a glimpse of him and to hail his arrival. And by the huge masses that were there and the probably millions of people, one might have thought it was Jesus Christ himself making his triumphal entry. Only it wasn't Christ, was it? You see, he's a, he's a man just like you and I are. He's a human being. And yet he is worshipped and adored as a God, as a father. And beloved, if there was ever a case of blatant idolatry, I believe that's it. In Matthew 23 and verse 9, Jesus says, You call no man 
on earth your father. There is only one father, and he's in heaven. How much plainer could that be? Some of you probably remember the night the Beatles, some of you who are older, when they made their first appearance of the Ed Sullivan Show back in February of 1964. Over 73 million people tuned in that night to watch John and Paul and George and Ringo walk on that stage. Women in that audience that night were screaming and they were swooning as they worshipped that rock band from England. And later on, John Lennon made that blasphemous statement. We are more popular than Jesus Christ himself. As young girls fell at his feet. You see, this form of idolatry has and always been very widespread in the world and in this country. We worship musicians, we worship athletes, we worship Hollywood stars like they're gods. You remember in Acts 10 and verse 25 when Peter entered the house of Cornelius. Cornelius knelt down at the feet of Peter and started worshiping him. And Peter grabbed him and said, you get up. Don't you worship me. I myself am a man just like you are. So we need to understand, beloved. Idols can be people. We must be careful to never let people become an idol in our lives. And did you know family can become an idol? You ever heard one say, my kids are my world? Or he's my world or she's my world? Luke 14, 26, what did Jesus say? If anyone comes to me, it does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Now, if you are a student of the New Testament, you understand Jesus is not telling us to hate our families. But rather he's saying this. Anyone who loves their family more than me cannot be my disciple. Now the Bible clearly teaches us that we husbands are to love our wives. And you wives are to love your husbands. And we as parents are to love our children. But you listen closely. When family activities regularly keep you out of the Lord's house on the Lord's day, you need to search your heart. Because it is possible that maybe our love for our family has surpassed our love for God when that becomes an idol, when we have company or we have family activities and that stands and gets in our way of worshiping our true God. That's what Jesus meant when he says, if you love your family more than me, you cannot be my disciple. When one regularly lets their family cause them to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, Hebrews 10, 25, again, I believe we incite the righteous anger of God and his jealousy. I could give you more examples. But you see, idolatry, at the root of it, is self. Idolatry is a very selfish sin. The idolater has not yet yielded the throne of his or her life to the one true and living God. Now, none of us want to think of ourselves as idol worshipers. In fact, we may even take offense at that notion. But if we'll be completely honest this morning and we'll search the dark corners of our hearts, Maybe we'd have to confess that if there's anything or anyone in our life that's more important to God in our life, maybe that's become our idol unknowingly. 
Just as God commanded the Israelites long ago to repent of their idolatrous ways, return to Him. That same God today, I believe, commands us in the New Testament to do the same. Little children, flee from idolatry. Keep yourselves from idols. In closing, I want you to ask yourself, what is that one thing that my whole world revolves around? Ask yourself, what is that one thing that I'm more passionate about than God? What is that one thing that you could not live without if God asked you to give it up? Take a good look at it because that is your idol. And that's why John of Inspiration says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. This morning, if you're not a child of the one true and living God, please come to him today. If you're serving the world, and there's other things in your life that are greater than God this morning, God's righteous anger and jealousy is upon you. He loves us today. He gave us heaven's best. That's all he asks of us, is just do your best. We can't be perfect. That's why we have the grace of God. When we blatantly put other things and other people ahead of God and ahead of our worship to Him, He says, that has become your idol and it's got to go. We love you today and He loves you. And we ask you this morning, if there's anything in your life that's standing between you and heaven, remove it today. While together we stand and while we sing.